An escalating political crisis in Hong Kong over the past six months has led to violent clashes between police and demonstrators. Now, elections have amplified that discontent. With us to assess the city's political crisis and its challenge to Beijing's rule, Emily Lau. She is a former Democratic Party member of the Hong Kong Legislative Council and chair of the Hong Kong Democratic Party's Foreign Affairs Committee, and we are delighted to welcome you to TVO. Thank you it's very, very nice much. nice to meet you. What is your response to the elections that had just transpired last weekend, which saw the pro-democracy candidates do extremely well? well? It was very good, better than expected, and I think the people have spoken loudly and clearly in a very peaceful way, just via the ballot box. They say they are opposed to Carrie Lam, the chief executive, and of course, to Beijing's interference. So what we hope to see happening is not Beijing coming on us like a ton of bricks, but that they would listen to the demands of the people uh, and start responding so then life can return to normality, I hope. Well, that is the key question. You've sent out a message. Do you think that message has been received by Beijing? I don't know. Actually, I speak as someone who has not been allowed to travel to mainland China for several decades. So. I hope to use your program to talk to Beijing. I'm sure they're watching it. Why can't you go to China? Well, you've got to ask them. And some people say, your mouse. The first chief executive of Hong Kong, Mrs. C.H. Tong, he said to me, Emily, don't talk too much. Take a step back. No, take three steps backward. I said, C.H., I've been elected to represent the people, and you asked me not to talk too much. What's the matter with you? But that's the problem with Beijing. They don't like people to say things they don't want to hear. And if I am residing in mainland China, Steve, I will probably get, by coming onto your show, 10 years or more for subverting state power. So you don't want to go there right now, actually. No, I don't. I don't want to be locked up for 10 no, or 15 exactly, years. Exactly. But I still speak up. Understood. And there could be horrible consequences. That's why people in Hong Kong are so fearful. What do you think? You mentioned Carrie Lam, the chief executive in Hong Kong. What should she do now? Well, she should go. She should resign, having caused the biggest crisis in Hong Kong's history. And of course, she should tell Beijing, urge Beijing to listen to the wishes of the people. And we are not asking for independence, Steve. Don't get it wrong. Beijing has been out smearing us, saying, oh, these are separatists. They just want to break away from the People's Republic of China. There may be a small number who do, but the vast majority of the Hong Kong people just want Beijing to keep the promise. The promise from 1997 That's being... Right. Giving Hong Kong a high degree of autonomy under their policy of one country, two systems. Mm -hmm. Maybe the Canadians don't know what it's all about, but it's oh, about... I, I think we do, actually, because we kind of live it, too. We have French and English that has been a, it... a feature of our relations here for 150-plus years. Yeah, but, but ours is just to let us continue with our free lifestyle, mm -hmm. which many people in the mainland do not have, and to have the rule of law and personal safety. These mm -hmm. are the things that Beijing promised. But now it seems Beijing is interfering in our lifestyle, left and right and center. People are very fearful. And then the extradition bill, which sparked off the six months of turmoil, mm -hmm. which is not ending, is made people very scared. Tell they, us what's in that bill. They want to send us to mainland China for trial if there are crimes which exist in both places. And people say, no way! Over there is complete lawlessness. And I speak with some authority, Steve, because I am on the board of directors of the China Human Rights Lawyers Concern Group. Mm. We formed the group in Hong Kong to support the human rights lawyers in China. They are being persecuted very badly, but they are very brave. They are not fleeing the country. They stay and fight. And for China to go forward, it needs the rule of law. And for that, you need truly independent lawyers. Mm. There are more than 200,000 lawyers in China, but only about 300 human rights lawyers who, who don't care about getting rich. And they are not political. They are just defending ordinary people who have their homes taken away, children fed with, you know, poison milk powder. And they get persecuted. And we support them. And they say, you Hong Kong, 
you must preserve a free and vibrant Hong Kong, which has the rule of law. And that, if that's possible, it would not just be good for Hong Kong, but good for China and good for the international community. Do you not want to see a civilized member of the international community? I do indeed. And uh, we have to help <laughs> to bring that about. Did they not pull the, extra bi uh, the extradition bill that you referred to, though? Of course. So shouldn't this be, why, why, is, why are the protests persisting if the bill has been pulled? But that was after a few months mm -hmm. of protests and clashes with the police. And you must have seen the police brutality on your screen. Of course. And so that thing, because of the brutality, so many people have been arrested and injured. So it's morphed into this big demand for reform of the police force, for investigation of how come they behave in such a barbaric way. Okay, but I see two different things on my television set when I watch the international news, and you tell me about this, because I... Obviously, there is a huge chunk of protesters who just want to peacefully protest and make their voices heard. There is a small... I mean, I think you'd have to acknowledge this. There's a smaller group that want to damage property and that want to be more violent, and what do you do about them? Well, I think at initially they were not violent. But then when the police started beating up people and so on, so they got very angry. And they have to express their anger. I speak as someone who has never advocated violence, but I can understand. And they are putting their own life at stake. And, uh, and the police responded by escalating the level of violence. So can you believe that the police, which is fully armed, and these people just have a little face mask and so on against the police? I mean, it, it is terrible. No, I'm not saying it's a fair fight, but, but when you storm the Legislative Assembly and you defile the Legislative Assembly, I mean, if you're going for the hearts and minds of the public, there were members of the public who did not like to see that, right? True. And you know what one of the, uh, the graffiti they scroll mm -hmm. on the wall after they storm in? Yes. They say, it is you who taught us peaceful demonstration is useless. Terrible, isn't it? <laughs> Terrible. Let me ask you about some of the responses from other countries in the world. And we'll start with the United States, because the American Congress has passed the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act. And in your view, how does that change the state of play? Well, I hope it will send a very unambiguous signal to Beijing and to the people, the officials in Hong Kong and the police that, you know, if they really continue to undermine human rights in Hong Kong and the rule of law and all that, they could be targeted. They could be punished. And if the American president, the administration... He signed said, it. The president signed the bill. But he has to move to say, ah, Joe Blow, <laughs> you are targeted. You cannot enter the U.S. or your assets will be frozen. Mm. And, and to, I think it will send chill <laughs> down the spine of many people. And, and, and I'm sure you know many of them, whether in Hong Kong or in mainland China, they have people living in the U.S., properties in the U.S., and if suddenly they find out they could be targeted, they could be banned, or their properties and assets would be frozen, Wow, I think that is a powerful thing. That would get their attention. So it's one thing to pass the law, but they now have to enforce it, is what That's you're right. saying. That's right. And I saw on the news this morning saying President Trump, who wants to have a trade deal with China, may probably tell President Xi Jinping, don't worry, you <laughs> know, I will not use it. Unless, of course, if you're really too brutal, but otherwise, don't worry, it would be just like some dressing, window dressing there. Wait a second, are you saying President Trump might actually say something that he doesn't mean? He does it every day, my dear friend. <laughs> are you born yesterday? I am being facetious, my dear. <laughs> I don't think you should do that on your program. <laughs> Next question. China hates it when other countries interfere in their internal dealings. Do you think the Americans are, possibly unwisely, if they want good relations with China, interfering in China's internal dealings? Well, I, I think, actually, maybe you say it's interfering, but it is an act of Congress, an act of the, pres the President of the United States within their sovereign right. And they also interfere in your country. Just a few days ago, the Chinese ambassador here told your government off, now, don't follow the U.S. Otherwise, there could be tremendous <laughs> dire consequences. See, they keep interfering in other people's business, and then they tell people not to interfere in their business. But to me, 
my dear friend, human rights, democracy, and the rule of law, universal values, they transcend national boundaries. People all over the world have a duty to speak out when they see human rights violations taking place elsewhere. So I would not regard that as interference. I have traveled to the United Nations to observe hearings on Hong Kong, and I've told different committee members, and they all agree. It's not interference. You all have a duty to speak out. And then, well, I don't know why they tell your government, the, the Chinese ambassador told your government, nah, don't follow the Americans. <laughs> don't have the Magnitsky Act to uh, punish Chinese officials. Do you regard that as interference in Canadian affairs? Well, we know that we, we know that for the first four years of Justin Trudeau's prime ministership, things got off the rails with China. A relationship that was supposed to be pretty good from the beginning got pretty terrible pretty quickly for a bunch of reasons. So I think, I think Canada, is, Canada is certainly listening to China in terms of how to put the relationship back into the way it could properly be. You were at the Halifax Security Forum, right? Yeah. What did you suggest to... I mean, I presume you left our government with a message as to how you think we should proceed? Yeah, your defence minister was there. And I say, you know... You have to stand up for what you believe in. Well, we got the John McCain Prize, and this is what John McCain is all about, speaking out, have the courage. And I told your defense minister, I said, you should do that. And if you speak out for Hong Kong, it's not just for Hong Kong, my dear friend, although you've not been there. You know, there are 300,000 Canadians, citizens, living and working in Hong Kong and over a 1,000 Canadian companies. So you are helping your own people, as well as helping mm. the 7 million. So of course you should do that. And I hope your Prime Minister, and although, although I've been here for just a few days in Halifax and now in Toronto, the Canadians I've met, they all say, gee, our Prime Minister is so spineless and so, uh, so timid. But, of course, the business people are telling him, Prime Minister, we want to sell pork, sell lobsters, sell gas well, to China. And, Nothing wrong with that. And, Emily, there's two, there's two Canadians in jail in Beijing as well, and he's... I'm, I'm he sure, wants to get them out. Of course he does, yeah. But then... But you know the Chinese. I'm sure you know the Chinese government. Well, they don't they, respect weakness, do they? Exactly. Yeah. If you have to speak with toughness and for what you believe in. And as, as Donald Trump would say, you do a deal. You don't just say, okay, we sell you pork, you give us money. <laughs> Forget about the two Michaels. <laughs> Forget about Canadian dignity and all these things that we believe in. Mm -hmm. No, you are in power. You have to learn to strike the balance. You just cannot cave into all the business lobbies' demand and, and to hell with what the Canadian people want. And many Canadians, I'm sure you know better than I do, they want these in universal values, uh, mm -hmm. not just here but also for your citizens in Hong Kong and elsewhere. So they want the government to stand up and speak for them. And, and what do you think China will do? What do you mm. think? Why, uh, why is the government here so scared? You tell me. Well, th they are scared that something bad will happen to the two Michaels who are in prison in Beijing, and they are terrified that China will continue to flex their economic money. They're, they're a billion people. We're 35 million, 36 million. 37. They're 37 maybe now, <laughs> yes. And, and I'm sure every government, regardless of Stripe, is terrified of the fact that China might just decide to say, OK, that's it, we're not buying any more of your stuff ever, ever again. So the Canadians will starve? No, but every, every Canadian prime minister needs to keep an eye on the bottom line. It's a fact. Of course. You yeah. have to balance various yes. things. You know what happened in Sweden last week? They had, of course, you know the Causeway Bay booksellers. The many were abducted to China. Mm -hmm. One is a Swedish citizen. Okay. He's still in, locked up in China. And the international pen offered an award to him. Hmm. Of course, he can't go and collect it. it. The ceremony was in Stockholm. And the Chinese told the Swedish government, don't go and attend the ceremony. What happened? The culture minister attended. This lady read, made a long speech. And the China said, OK. You will be banned. You and officials from your ministry cannot go to China. And the Prime Minister of Sweden said, we have freedom of expression in this country. Sweden may be smaller than Canada. Much, yes. <laughs> so yeah. I don't want you and your country to send out a message to Beijing that if we are small, we are 30-odd million, we are at your mercy. 
Wow, gee, what sort of a message is that, my dear friend? You don't want to send that message. So develop a spine is your message. I think so. Stand up, have dignity. I do but want also to... also defend the interests of the Canadians. No, I'm not saying you shouldn't. Mm -hmm. You picked that plate up very quickly, and I did want to bring a little more attention to it because you did win the John McCain Prize for Leadership in Public Service. No, no, no. It's for the Hong Kong people, my dear friend. Well, okay, but you've got it. You're holding on to it right now. And, uh, you know, for those who don't know, obviously it was named after the former Arizona senator who was a, a, a leading light for many, many decades in American political life. And I'm interested in how significant you think that is to your cause. Well, I think it's very significant because it is really, at this, especially at this very critical juncture where people are fighting on the street, are being tear gassed every day. Mm -hmm. uh, and then suddenly this thing cropped up and they offer it to the Hong Kong people. And Mrs. Cindy McCain actually mm -hmm. delivered it, mm -hmm. presented it to us, me and Figo Chan. And, and she said, it's not just for the Hong Kong people. It's for people all over the world who are engaged in struggle for democracy and human rights. And I think that's right. And it's good for people who are being tear gassed every day in the street, beaten up by the police, to know that they are friends in other places who support us, friends who don't just care about making money, who don't just uh, care about pleasing Beijing so that they can have a good life. So I, I think it's very good. And Figo and I are going to take it back to Hong Kong. We don't know where to put it because it's for the Hong Kong people. So we can't just put it in our office. <laughs> <laughs> I do want to ask you in our remaining moments here, yes, the, the demonstrations have gotten violent. The police reaction to the demonstrations has been very uh, upsetting. But you remember what happened 30 years ago in Tiananmen Square, obviously. And we know that when the Chinese government wants to react with brutal force, they have, they can, and they will. And I wonder how worried you are about the protests turning genuinely fatal. Well, of course, with the Chinese government, no one can rule anything out. Right. Because if I did, you would say, Emily, uh, is something wrong with your brain? So I would not. But we have to keep telling them not to do it. And the Canadian government, the international community, and Donald Trump, should keep telling them, hey, don't do it. We don't want a tenement in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. We don't want to see rivers of blood flowing in Hong Kong. So we have to keep telling them. And they, I think, although they're getting richer and richer, I think they still need Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. uh, come a day when they don't. <laughs> I don't know, we'll be worse than Xinjiang maybe. But uh, so, so we have to keep reminding them. And of course, I want everybody to dial down de-escalate. But the government has to respond to the very legitimate demands of the people. Otherwise, like a bad penny, they'll keep turning up. <laughs> and then maybe you uh, come back to your show six months later. Emily, this is one year already. Why? What are you doing? I know the people will not stop. Why? Because they are fighting for their future, my dear friend, fighting for human rights, rule of law and democracy. Which we have here. And I hope you will always have it. Because the lesson from Hong Kong is that something you thought so peaceful, so safe, no democracy, but rule of law. Mm -hmm. And within a few months, it can completely just be dismantled it is before fresh. your very eyes. Yes. So it's a salutary lesson to people all over the world, including our friends in Canada. Absolutely. Emily Lau, we're so grateful you spared some time for us on your visit here to Canada. Stay safe when you go home, and we'd be delighted to welcome you back here again when you return to Canada. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario, and by viewers like you. Thank you.